morning, everybody. I would like to welcome you on behalf of the South African Civil Society Information Service, SACSIS, and Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, FES. My name is Axel Schmidt, and I'm the resident director of FES. Today's panel discussion uh, is to some extent a continuation of a conversation that Fazila and I had one and a half year ago um, about the pros and cons of a tax-based uh, universal social protection, as, for example, the envisaged NHI, National Health Insurance. And in our conversation, we came up to the conclusion or major conclusion um, that such an endeavor, such a project would, res would find quite a lot of resistance in South African society. Uh, and the, succe the success of such a huge reform as the national health insurance would need uh, in particular the buy-in of South Africans middle class. Um, for as me as an observer, I'm not South African citizen, but I'm, I'm living here quite some time and I've followed the debate about the national health insurance and the general notion of universal coverage. Um, I think there are two sticking points. The one is that from the individual perspective of a middle class person, citizen, who usually would be privately insured, um, he feels or he has the feeling that such a national or universal health insurance would deteriorate, let's say, the quality of his currently private insurance to some extent. Um, on the other side, um, the voices are coming from and the concerns are coming from the so-called health industry. Health industry brings in a lot of rational arguments, uh, why it, it's not going to work, why it will be difficult, and, and so on and so forth. I think, and that is my personal view, at the end, uh, coming it, opening, let's say, the private, the current private health sector to a general large public um, would mean uh, a loss of profitability for them. And particularly, as it is a linkage between public and private, uh, that the public in that way uh, the South African government or the, let's say, this, the scheme that would then refund um, the hot private hospitals for services that they deliver to the general public, maybe these payments or these refunds are coming in, let's say, late, too late, or maybe, if at all, for whatever reasons are. So that is, as my, my, from my view, two major sticking points as I followed the debate. <coughs> Nonetheless, as the discussion of the national health insurance has progressed over the last years, I think it is a good idea to come back to our previous reflections uh, and about to talk about this type of resistance. In particular, to as well convince or um, open up, warm up <coughs> South Africans' middle class for the idea of universal coverage. And therefore, I would like to take this opportunity to make a plea. A plea um, in the sense that, according, in my view, a universal coverage or a universal social protection for all citizens can create more equality in South Africa. And in particular, South Africa is uh, condemned or currently in a situation where, where you have high inequality. My view is living in a society where there is equality and citizens are more equal or more equal than as here, contributes much more to a so social peace in a certain way. And secondly, as well, from an individual citizen's point of view, middle class considers social mobility always upwards. Well, that's fine when I'm young. I have the world in front of me. I feel my strength, I'm going to master all what is going to happen. So why shall I care for health insurance or for social protection? It's fine, I find a job, I settle, get married, then I have children, 
Well, then they need as well to be covered somehow, because that's part of my responsibility as a parent to take care of my family, and as well extend this responsibility in terms of protection, social protection. All right, I may be able still to finance a private insurance scheme for my family. Then I'm getting older, I become senior, and suddenly, let's say, mechanisms of capitalist society kick in, I get retrenched. With 50, two children, adolescent, uh, going to school and whatever, and now suddenly no money coming in. I cannot continue to pay my insurance. <coughs> and then my slide downwards, and was I perceived me as middle class, I'm upwards and I'm striving to get up and up the ladder. I'm going to slide down very fast and my family with me downwards. So I come from a country where we had or have universal coverage and I really enjoy and I feel privileged to have it and I feel as well and by experience that has contributed at least in the German case but as well in other European countries where we have this type of universal social protection uh, has contributed for our social societal stability on the one side and as well as well as on an individual level of feeling safe even with all the risks that life may, uh, they may encounter. So therefore, I'm very grateful that we can invite to or hear uh, what we reflected upon, uh, Fisela and I, some, some months or one and a half years ago, to share this with some outstanding South African experts today. Uh, they're sitting here on the panel and um, I'm very curious to, to listen to their comments or their ideas. And I would like to thank, first of all, to my left, uh, Mark Haywood, followed by Louis uh, Reynolds, Robert van Niekerk, and David Sanders to be with us and to share their view on it. And I would like to thank you, Fazila, for organizing this public event. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Axel. Hello, everybody. It's lovely to be here in Cape Town. Our goal is to try and build a nurturing society, a society where we each care for each other. And this is why we are hosting this panel discussion today with uh, FES and focusing on health care for the poor. But, it, but as you will hear from our panelists today, the NHI presents an opportunity to build solidarity between South Africa, South Africa's middle class and the poor around the delivery of an important social good. It's an opportunity to see how the two groups can come together to make an important social, group, uh, social good work for both groups. But as you all know, there are many challenges with South Africa's healthcare system. Um, quite frankly, um, our public health care system in large parts of the country for the better part is broken and is unable to ful fulfill its mandate um, to poor South Africans. We do have world-class health care um, in South Africa. It's in the private sector, but it's incredibly expensive and really out of reach of many South Africans and increasingly becoming out of reach for people in the middle class as well. In fact, it's so expensive that the Competition Commission has launched an inquiry that's going to look um, at why healthcare in South Africa is so expensive. Ultimately, we've got a healthcare system that doesn't work. The question we're going to interrogate today is, does the, is the NHI a viable solution and will it build social solidarity around the delivery of this good, this, this important public good? As you'll hear from our speakers today, the NHI, the NHI proposals that are on the table at the moment are quite progressive. In fact, you know, in terms of providing health and, and viewing health as a human right, the, new, uh, the NHI is a policy proposal that does engage with it from, from that perspective. In fact, uh, access to health care is something that is enshrined in our constitution. It's a right that's protected. Uh, in our constitution. Health is a human right. It is not a commodity. 
it is not something we should leave up to the market to decide whether people can have access to it. The problem is that if we're going to build consensus around this idea, we've got to convince a lot of people that health is a human right in this country. Because for a lot of people, good health care is a privilege. And people see it as something that they're entitled to if they can afford it. Um, and this is the mindset that we've got to break. And that's why it's important to start building solidarity across different class groups in South Africa. But it's going to be very, very difficult to achieve. Because of the, the, the healthcare landscape and who's using what in South Africa, and because of our particular history in this country, the economic and, and racial architecture of this country is hugely problematic and it reflects in the healthcare system and how people use the healthcare system. Um, about uh, two, two or three weeks ago, uh, Stat South Africa released uh, results via a report, and it's based on the 2011 General Household Survey. And they looked at health statistics in ter terms of where people are lo located in terms of their use of the healthcare system in South Africa. What they found is that 88% of white South Africans use private healthcare facilities. Uh, this is followed by Indians. 64% of Indian South Africans use private healthcare facilities. Um, they prefer using these facilities. At the same time, 81% of black South Africans and over 63% of colored South Africans are using the public health care system in South Africa. So, you know, that particular situation reflects the problems um, of division, racial and uh, economic inequality in South Africa. We've got a huge challenge to overcome. We've got mindsets to change. I'm going to leave um, that framing out there for you to reflect on. And I'm going to turn now to my esteemed panel to engage with these issues. Um, we have Robert van Niekerk from Rhodes University. He's a professor of social policy at the Institute of Social and Economic Research. Um, we have David Sanders, he's an emeritus professor and founding director of the School of Public Health at the University of the Western Cape, um, a, a qualified uh, pediatrician in public health, and a founding member of the People's Health Movement in South Africa. Um, we have associate professor Louis Reynolds, also a pediatrician, who also formerly worked at the Red Cross Children's Hospital and also involved in the People's Health Movement. And of course, we have Mark Haywood, um, who is the director of Section 27, a public interest um, NGO in South Africa. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to uh, hand over to Robert to ki kick off the presentations. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to present on um, the national health insurance and its importance for us uh, in, in, in South Africa and what we're trying to achieve as a, as a wider society. I don't know if we can call the presentation up, uh, the technical guys, um, then I can actually talk to my slide. You can see from the title that um, I see the whole process of establishing a national health insurance system is about a bigger project about a new kind of society. I think very deeply implicated in the idea of establishing a new kind of healthcare service which can bring classes together uh, across the social divide is the idea of a kind of society that we want to create in South Africa. I think this is the first opportunity post 94 that this question is not an external question that explores the condition of the poor as an external category. It's absolutely about the choices and the position of the middle class in creating a new kind of South African society. So I think the debate about establishing a new kind of healthcare system needs to be coupled with the idea of what kind of society do we want to live in as South Africans and not externalize the problem as something about how do we create access for poor people to health care, but also talked about how we contribute as citizens who are more privileged from the middle classes, largely, both in terms of being part of the political elite, the policy elites, and other sec professional sectors, about what choices are we wanting to make about creating a new kind of South African society. And I absolutely believe that the debate around the national health insurance proposals and how it's resolved will be a litmus test 
for the kind of society we want to create in South Africa, and that will either be a more polarized, fractured society based on, on class and social and racial inequality, or a more inclusive society. So I think we shouldn't lose sight of that bigger agenda. And that's why I call my, my title the kind of future society we want to, to create in South Africa. Um, sorry, let me just call my... So, um, so just to re reflect on what we're confronting in terms of a, a, a looming crisis, we have an unsustainable two-tier model of healthcare provision. And it's a crisis that also confronts the middle class. In terms of actual spending, we find that South Africa is well within the range that the, the WHO recommends for, for spending of a country of our, our size. However, it's deeply inequitably split. The split of funds, the total GDP flows into healthcare, you find that 4.1% of the total funds, or 50% of the total funds, is only utilized by 16% of the population. And the remaining 50%, 84% of the population has to, to deal with. And those are people who don't have the means to afford private forms of care. So if South Africa epitomizes anything, it's an anti-social solidaristic model. It's kind of perhaps the par excellence example of an anti-social solidaristic model, where there's a complete bifurcation between access to healthcare, between the private and the public sector, based on someone's class position and also the labor market position, so to speak. But for the middle classes, it's also becoming increasingly unsustainable because private healthcare costs have increased by 120% over the last 10 years. And it's a, based on an unsustainable commercial model of healthcare provision, which reflects a mismatch between services and costs. Okay? And we have 102 medical aid schemes uh, where the costs in terms of uh, people accessing those medical aid schemes packages, in terms of the average wages, increased from 7% in the 1980s to 30% by 2008. So increasingly, you're going to find that more, and what is happening at the moment, that more middle class people actually squeeze out of healthcare service provision. They can't afford the costs. And so it's a huge issue for the middle class about how we get a more affordable system of public health care of sufficient quality that the middle class can also buy into. Okay, so I think it's a crucial question. I don't think the issue of a new kind of health care is something that is separate from the, the position of the middle class in terms of their health care, uh, their health care needs into the future. But another telling indication of the social, the actual lack of social solidarity in the system is that in fact the state incentivizes the private sector healthcare system through the medical aid subsidies that it gives to essentially professional employees. And that amounts to 10 billion rand. So that's a gift of the state to the middle class, okay, for providing a differentiated form of health care, a level of quality that's not seen in poorer sections of our society, but in fact is the mechanism by which this anti-social solidaristic model is reproduced. It's through this medical aid, this tax subsidy that I get as a professional who works at Rhodes University who accesses a medical aid scheme, part of which is subsidized by the state, which allows me to access private medical care in a place like Grahamstown. And if I'm privileged to have a domestic worker, that domestic worker can't access that quality of care. They're dependent on the public system of care. So there's no cross-subsidization happening. And in fact, it's in the antithesis of a social solidaristic model. Okay? And the cost, it's the extremity of, 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 of the differentiation reflected in the fact that private patients, 11,150 rand is spent on private patients compared to 2,760 cent per capita on public patients. And the whole human resource structure is geared towards the private sector with 59% of doctors, 93% of dentists, 89% of pharmacists, all in the private sector. Okay, so the whole system is geared around meeting the needs of the private care sector and those who have the privilege access to, 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 to access private health care. Um, and it's a completely unsustainable model. Okay, and that's where the national health insurance proposals come into play. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, have I not got you on this slide? I think what's very important is the language of the national health insurance is a misnomer. Because in fact, it's not an insurance-based model. What's being proposed is a tax-based model, which is much more consistent with the national health service. For example, the one that we have in the UK. So, and I think there's a, there's a politics about why the insurance is privileged in that idea of a national health insurance model. But I think we should assure ourselves of the idea that what we're talking about is an insurance-based model. It's actually a national health service. And as groups within civil society and the wider populace and the people coming from professional positions, we have some policy influence, we should reaffirm that the objective is actually to establish a national health service, okay? 
And part of the elements of a national health service is that it's about universal health care access. And that's what the NHI proposals are talking to, that they want to extend universal access. Now, for South Africa, that's an incredibly radical proposal. Because what it's arguing is that everyone, regardless of their social position and their financial position, should have access to a basic basket of health care. Okay? And that shouldn't be means tested. That's a complete and radical departure from social policies that we've had since 1994, which have been means tested, which have been selective, and which have been exclusionary. And what it allows us, it allows us to talk and, 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 and cohere around language of creating a far more inclusive society because we are, we, we, we are, we are attached by this idea of a universal approach to healthcare provision. Okay? Some of the NHI objectives are to improve access to quality healthcare, pro provide financial risk protection, improve cost subsidization, and provide an essential health care package. So the package, the, 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 the set of proposals itself is trying to break from this tradition of an antisocial solidaristic model to one that's increasingly about the middle class working with other social groups like the poor, the unemployed, to pool health care resources in a way that health care can go to those who need it, not on the basis of the ability to pay, but on the basis of need. Again, a radical proposal for, for South African social policy into the future. And then the principles, I think, are the crucial ones that we, I think, us as the civil society groups need to cohere around. It's about right to access, where healthcare will be free at the point of delivery. And that, of course, gives effect to a constitutional principle that everyone has a right of access to healthcare services, and it's the state's responsibility to, right, to realize such social rights. It's also crucially, crucially about social solidarity. And that has not been a principle that's been encoded in South African social policy since 94. Since 94, it's been about how we deal with the poor as an external category, about how we develop policy that deals with this condition while the middle class are, in, in large respects, divorced from the problems of poverty and inequality. This idea of social solidarity as embedded in the NHI principles completely breaks with that tradition because embedded in the agenda that's being proposed is the idea that this can only succeed if the middle class buy in to a universal system of healthcare provision. And it will fail if we can't get the middle class to buy into this healthcare provision. In real terms, one of the things and one of the consequences of the effect of these proposals is that the middle class needs to consider giving up the tax subsidy, this 10 billion rand that they get to access private care and to pool those funds into a single fund so that healthcare can go to those who need it. And that's a big choice that the middle class is going to have to confront. And I think it comes back to the issue of the consciousness of the middle class in realizing and, and seeing the need to, 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 to achieve that objective. And it's also based on equity, crucially, that those with greatest health care need are provided with timely access and expansion of access to quality care to vulnerable groups. And I think one has to contextualize this, and what I would argue as a historian of social policy, that these proposals are absolutely an indication of a social democratic approach to healthcare provision, where healthcare is an entitlement of social citizenship. It's not an discretion, it's an entitlement of social citizenship, and it's based on cross-class cross, cross -class solidarity for universal provision of public goods. And I think that is the real radical underpinning of this agenda, and I don't think we should lose that agenda, the principles and the values that underpin healthcare provision into the future. Okay, so I've talked about equity, social solidarity, and right to access, why those are important. Um, I won't talk to the model of implementation because Dave will be dealing with that. Um, and I think I want to make a point about the battle of ideas because that's what's happening in South Africa at the moment. You'll see that a lot of government's attention is towards the development of a developmental state. However, and how it's framed is quite exclusionary. For example, Minister President Zuma said, we are building a developmental state and not a welfare state, uh, and the social grants will be linked to economic activity and community development to enable short-term beneficiaries to become self-supporting in the long run. There's a sort of a polarization between the idea of a developmental state and a welfare state. And it comes back to this idea the welfare state causes dependency as a kind of rehashing of kind of a new liberal language that we saw in Thatcherite Britain in the 1970s, where essentially there was an argument that the state needs to, pour, to pull back the market needed to provide people's social needs, for people's social needs and social goods. However, and this is where the battle of ideas come in, if you actually look at ANC policy, it talks to universal primary education, it talks to a national statutory social insurance arrangements, uh, it talks to, and of course, most importantly, the national health insurance proposals, which are about universal access uh, and the main source of revenue being an NHA fund, which will be tax-based. Okay? Now, these are all the key attributes of a social democratic policy, set of policies. So there's a policy schizophrenia in the ANC. 
On the one level, it's talking about its developmental state and privileging economism. On the other level, in terms of substance of social policy, it's completely about a social democratic approach, which is about universalization of social provision, universalization of public goods, based on cross-class social solidarity. And I think that's where we need to locate ourselves in terms of these battle of ideas. Um, now, I think what's quite important is to also understand that um, that embedded in South African history, in, in the policy history, is deeply, uh, deeply embedded is this idea of a national health service, and one that is universal, and that one is which is state provided. Um, and I think the starting point for me is to look at, for example, the Gluckman Commission of 1942 to 1944, perhaps the most radical set of proposals that ever emerged about healthcare reform in South Africa. And in fact, I would say that is the most radical form of, of proposals that emerged. And essentially, Gluckman was in, sat in the, in the 1940s. Um, it was a committee of the SMIT, of the, of the uh, SMUTS government of the time, but was led by a radical progressive called Henry Gluckman. And what his vision was, to establish a national health service in South Africa that would be uh, non-racial, that would be democratic, and that would be based on preventative health care. And in this, his prognosis of the problems of South African health care was that the mere provision of mere doctoring would not be provide more health. So essentially he was pushing for a preventative health care model. He talked to the problems of South African health care being a spectacle of divided control, poor coordination, overlapping and maldistribution, and gaps, and a crazy patchwork of provision. We know this because this is very similar to what we have currently. And he also talked to the proper integration and coordination of the various health services would be better achieved if the services were nationally planned and directed. So essentially, Gachman was arguing that if you want to achieve a national health service in South Africa, if you want to have provision for all citizens in the country, you needed to nationalize health, the health care services. <coughs> and that would need it to be based on uh, the surrendering of the provinces of the control of the healthcare services. So the state needed to take control of the healthcare services and the delivery of the health services would be decentralized into 20 regions and be based on 400 preventative health centers. And he was very influenced by the work of Sidney Clark who developed the Polella experiment, the preventative healthcare care model. And crucial, he said that it would be based on essentially funded health tax. And the principle is kind of the epitome of a social democratic approach, which he said, that healthcare should be funded on an equitable basis from each in proportion to his means instead of inequitable from each according to the degree of his ill health. And this is proposals that emerged between 42 and 44. Okay? And what's crucial as well is also to indicate the historical support for these proposals. You found, for example, the um, civil society groups, including the trade unions, the political parties, the ANC, the Communist Party of South Africa, were fully supportive of the Gluckman proposals. And I think it's important to reflect on what the Medical Association of South Africa were willing to, to, to say about these proposals. They said, we are prepared on our own initiative to surrender some of our independence and to become to some extent a socialized profession. So the Medical Association of South Africa in the 40s were saying, yes, we prepare to be socialized. In fact, we prefer to be socialized, but we know that in terms of where the country is politically, what we need to establish is a, national, a nationalized healthcare service. So this is the depth in which there was the support for a national health service in the 40s. And this, these proposals, of course, failed to be implemented because Smuts rejected the idea that the provinces should, the control of healthcare should be taken away from the provinces. Um, and so the, the proposals were shelved. And I think part of our historical agenda is how do we reclaim the impetus of what Gluckman represented was, which was the impetus towards establishing a universal national healthcare service. But historically, you found that the idea of a national health service was also very deeply embedded in the ANC. For example, the ANC under Kuma produces a very important historical document called African Claims, which had a Bill of Rights, and which represented, <coughs> I would argue, the first emergence of so a social democratic approach to, 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 South, to, to the South African state. He talks to the right of every child to free and compulsory education, equality of treatment with regards to uh, income maintenance, and most importantly, the establishment of free medical and health service for all sections of the population. So that's ANC policy in 1943, perhaps the most crucial ANC document to emerge in the 40s, a document called African Claims. It's reflected again in the Freedom Charter, under with which we, 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 uh, uh, Albert Lutuli was the, the, the head. A right to, f to free state-provided health care, prevented health care scheme to be run by the state, free medical and health care of hospitalizations provided for all special care. So you can see that historically this idea of a national health service, and in fact I would argue a social democratic uh, health care service, is very deeply embedded in, in, in ANC history. Um, and this discourse reflects 
A discourse that was influenced by what was happening in Britain at the time, which was at these Labour Party establishing the welfare state based on universal access of the poor and the middle class to a single form of, of, of provision. Um, and that there was this cross filtering of ideas. And I think we, need, must not, we must not lose sight that embedded in this idea of a national health insurance in South Africa is this very strong and powerful policy history which is aiming to establish a national health service. And I would argue that what we're trying to achieve here is the completion of this incomplete historical project, which is establishing a South African national health service, which will be more inclusive. <coughs> of course, after 1994, you found that this, again reflected in key policy documents like the RDP based document, was the idea of universal provision of, of, of social policy, including a preventative health care service, a national health care service. It was reflected in the ANC's election manifesto. It's reflected in the 90s in ANC policy thinking about establishing a national health service. It's reflected in the National Health Plan for South Africa in 1994. What I'm trying to argue here is that there's been a complete consistency of ideas around establishing a national health service, but that those ideas are displaced after the ANC comes into power. You found the group around uh, the gear economic frame become hegemonic, and there's the displacement of this universal idea. It's about then means tested, it's about the poor becoming an external category, about the middle class being separate from an agenda of an inclusive approach to transforming South African healthcare. And you saw that in the documents that emerged, the white paper on the RDP, for example, had language of affordability, cost containment, privatization. There's a shift from a social democratic language, there's an abandonment of that language. Okay, and that's most tellingly consolidated in the GEAR program. And the important thing for social policy of GEAR is that revolution restraint, that fiscal restraint of reducing the fiscal deficit to 3%, which means there was a massive squeeze on social expenditure. And that was there was this decisive break with the social demo more inclusive social democratic agenda. However, okay, I've, I need to wrap up. Um, I think where I want to end it is to say that what we're finding here is that it's absolutely in the interest of the middle class to be engaged in this debate around establishing a national health service. Let's call it the NHI. Uh, that it is about how we create a new kind of society, how we create a new kind of capitalism. We contest this idea of capitalism. That is not a laissez-faire capitalism that we're looking for. That is a more social democratic capitalism. Maybe that's the roadway to a socialist possibility. I hope it would be. But I think that's where the level of the contestation has to happen and that it's about coalition building and social compacting uh, with a value basis around universalism and social solidarity. I think the NHI proposals and Minister Mozzoledi gives us a profound opportunity to reclaim that redistributive agenda that's historically embedded, I think, in ANC policy since the 1940s. And I think the political education issue, it's about the middle classes now. I think it's about the consciousness of the middle classes and getting the middle classes to increasingly buy into the idea of universal public goods like, for example, the national health insurance system. I think that's absolutely possible. And I'd conclude that where the foci needs to now rest is to reclaim this historical agenda by talking about establishing a national health campaign. A national health campaign that can bring together social groups across strata and bring the middle class into a, a, a coalition that can start to start to talk to the establishment of a universal national health service in South Africa that the middle class can participate in equally with other sectors of society. And I think if we can achieve that, then we will create the bridgehead to the possibilities of a new kind of South African society, a new kind of inclusive South African society, which we're all struggling and still struggling to achieve since we achieved democracy in, in 1994. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, so I'm going to very quickly cover how we're doing in health, some of the major reasons for our poor performance, looking at issues both outside and within the health sector, and then I want to focus a bit more on some of these key new policies, the NHI and the current approach to implementing it, which is called re-engineering primary health care, look at some of the challenges and opportunities and some priorities. So, how are we doing? Sorry, um, I've got to get used to... Um. So, this graph, you may not be able to see all the countries from the back, but this plots wealth against health. 
So wealth is on the horizontal axis going from very little up to 50,000 US dollars. And on the y-axis, the vertical, it looks at life expectancy at birth. So you will see that some countries are above the line, like Bangladesh. It's doing better than you might expect for its level of wealth. China is also above the line, and the size of the circle is the size of the population. Where's South Africa? As you can see, we are way, way below the line. In fact, our life expectancy would be more in keeping with countries such as Cameroon or Niger. So, these are some of our health indicators. And as you can see, life expectancy is extremely low. Infant mortality, that is deaths before one year of age, are extremely high. And there are big provincial disparities, three times as high uh, in uh, the Eastern Cape as in the Western. Under five mortality, similarly, very high. And again, over twice as high in KZN versus the Western Cape, and a very high maternal mortality, that's deaths of women associated with pregnancy and childbirth. And I think you know we have the world's biggest HIV epidemic. So it's clear we have huge inequalities, and the inequalities really bring the average down. That's why we perform so poorly because our most populous provinces have such very, very poor health indicators. So this is a slightly old slide. Don't pay attention to the actual levels. But on the extreme left is Western Cape and on the extreme right is the Eastern Cape in terms of young child mortality. And even in Cape Town, this is some work from some years ago done by myself and colleagues looking at what were then the 11 sub-districts of Cape Town. And you can see infant mortality, the percent of households below the poverty line, HIV prevalence and percentage unemployment is concentrated in a few of those districts. You see we have our own twin towers in, uh, in Cape Town still existing. Of course, this is not confined to South Africa. Even in a country like Canada, there are big differences in life expectancy between the lowest income group, a tercile, that's 33% of the population, and the highest income. But of course, the disparities are not nearly as great as they are in South Africa. So what's causing this? Well, we've got four what are called colliding epidemics. Everyone's familiar with the HIV and TB one, with the problems of young children and mothers, and this relates especially to malnutrition and infectious diseases, diarrhea, pneumonia, newborn deaths, and so on. We have a huge epidemic of injury and violence, and a gathering and accelerating epidemic of chronic diseases diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, cancers, and so on. This is truly going to overwhelm our health service in the next decade or two. So what's causing this problem? What are the determinants? You may not be able to read this well from the back, but it says factors influencing infant mortality in South Africa comparing the poorest one-fifth of the population with the richest one-fifth. So in the circle, there is wealth. So you can see in the wealthiest, 20%, infant mortality is 22, and in the richest, uh, the poorest, it's 87, exactly four times as high. And similarly, for education, which is the brown one, Rural urban, the next, and by province, again, Eastern and Western Cape, and finally, 
by race, black and white. So just note, the white infant mortality is 15 per thousand. And many white people in this country live very well. In fact, most do. But you know, average infant mortality in a country like Norway is less than five. So even for the best off in our country, infant mortality is three times as high as it should be when compared to groups in the global north that are in the same income range. I'll come back to this. What I'm saying is inequality is bad for everyone. Of course it's worst for the poorest, but it's bad for everyone. And we know that in terms of violence, for example, in our society. It doesn't only affect the poorest, it affects them worst, but affects everyone. So a fundamental social determinant is poverty. <coughs> this just shows some data on child poverty, where it's shocking that six out of every 10 children live in households with an income of less than 575 rand per person per month. And it really makes me mad when, when I'm teaching, people talk about the poor misusing their money. And I always say to them, excuse me, could you live on 575 rand a month? And you think about it. It's extremely difficult. You have to be very clever, actually, to live on 575 rand a month. So this is the income share by decile. The population divided up into 10%. And you can see that 90% of people have a very, very small percentage share of the income. And 10% share 55% of total income in this country, and it's getting worse. There's 1993 compared with 2008. So what about the health sector itself? I've talked about some of the social determinants outside the health sector. What are the key challenges to improving access and quality? So there was a series published in the prestigious Lancet Journal a few years ago, and they came up with three issues that the health sector, three actions that need to be taken. One is regarding the health workforce. More, more skilled and more dedicated workforce. Sustainable and equitable access. That means access for everyone in terms of their need and competence and accountability of managers and leaders. So let's look at health expenditure. Louis kindly provided me with these slides. So if you look at South Africa's health spending in the panel on your left, you can see that, and this goes by years, you can see that it's gone up pretty sharply and it is way above the Africa region average. In fact, we spend more per capita than any other country in the region, in the Africa region. And I show on the right panel, because I'll come back to it, a very poor country, Rwanda, where you can see they spend far less than the regional average and far, far less than South Africa. So Robbie showed this, and just here uh, graphically, in South Africa, on the right, 35 million people rely wholly on the public sector, and they have approximately 1,900 rand spent on them per year, per person. And on the left, the 8 million about 15% of the population, 16% that rely wholly on the private sector, 
and they have about 11,300 rand spent on them. And in the middle, there are people, 8 million, who use both. They mainly use the public sector, but when they need to get to work and they can't afford to wait in line, they go and use a private GP, something like that. So the size of our private insurance in South Africa as a percentage of total health care expenditure is actually the highest in the world. It's higher even than the US. You see it goes South Africa, Namibia, and then the US. And as you know, Namibia was part of South Africa before, so it's not surprising. So is this a problem? So there is actually some empirical work done, not a lot, but Maureen McIntosh is the best researcher on this, and she shows healthy life expectancy on the vertical axis plotted against government expenditure on health as a percentage of GDP. And you can see there is an increase with government expenditure. And she shows the opposite in systems where private health expenditure is a large percentage of, of expenditure. I'll come to that in a second. Uh, I'm going to show it and come back. So here's the US compared to Costa Rica. So the US is an extremely privatized health system. At the bottom you'll see what their health expenditure is, 5,700 US per person per year. Costa Rica only $350. Gross national income, US per capita, is 10 times that of Costa Rica and yet Life expectancy and infant mortality are about the same. Costa Rica's got a public system and is highly equitable. So, what are we spending on? Well, we're spending especially on health workforce. So, South Africa, compared to the region, again, has four times almost as many health workers as the rest of the region, and Rwanda, by contrast, has about half the density of doctors, these are doctors, compared to the Africa region. This just shows South Africa compared to other countries. But, as Robbie showed, in the public sector, there's one person for 4,200 doctors. And if you're up in Limpopo, it's more like one to every 15,000 people. Whereas those who use the private sector, one doctor for only 600 people. So 70% of specialists are in the private sector, serving 16% of the population. And about 50% of doctors or in the private sector, serving 15%. So, how well are we doing? So, this shows immunization coverage in South Africa. And South Africa is the triangles, and the regional average is almost the same as in South Africa, except we've now dipped below the regional average. Rwanda, on the other hand, is way above the regional average, despite being an extremely poor country. So here are some other statistics on coverage, where we're not doing very well with our vitamin A supplementation program, with antenatal care, with exclusive breastfeeding, and so on. And this shows, again, South Africa compared with Rwanda, where you can see we now, both countries, have similar under five mortality. Our Millennium Development Goal is the bottom dotted line, so we won't reach it. And Rwanda's already reached its MDG goal of reducing under five mortality. So, finally, two major new health policies. NHI, which Robbie has talked about, and the current strategy to implement the NHI, which is called re-engineering primary health care. So 
the NHI is a mechanism for ensuring that everyone's able to get care when they need it and that they're financially protected from out-of-pocket costs. And the principles have already got, been gone over, so I'll leave those. So it's intended to increase funding, total pool of funding, through increased allocations from tax, a mandatory contribution, uh, kind of earmarked, small percentage, a levy if you like, removal of tax subsidies to medical aids, which Robbie talked about, which has got the private sector quite excited, because it will escalate our medical aid costs. And these funds will go into a pool, which will be called the NHI fund, <coughs> as far as we know. And then this fund will purchase from accredited public and private providers. The medical schemes, so far as we know, will remain, but it's likely, because they'll be more expensive, membership will decline. So there'll be an office of standards compliance, which has already been set up, which is accrediting facilities, and currently NHI is being piloted in 11 districts through re-engineering of primary health care. So there are three streams in this re-engineering. One is a ward-based outreach team for each ward, that means each sub-district, a school health stream, and district-based clinical specialist teams. I'm just going to talk about one of these and then end. So this is a diagram for our re-engineering NHI. You won't make head or tail of it, um, but it shows all of the components. The interesting one for me is the one on the right, shaped as a coffin, uh, and that's local government. I don't know if this is just a mistake, <laughs> but local government is shaped like a coffin. <clears throat> so the community outreach teams um, consist of a nurse, six community health workers, and other members, an environmental health officer, and um, a health promoter. These community health workers will cover households. Each one will cover 270 households. So how are we doing? There's recently been, and it was presented just a few weeks ago, to the Portfolio Committee, a 12-month progress report. And I've just got some of the slides. So there's a green paper, and I believe we have some copies of People's Health Movement response to the green paper in the room. Uh, and the white paper is under preparation. So these 11 pilot districts. These 11 domains have been appraised, and I'm not going to show you all of them. It's about management, hospitals, quality, human resources, and so on. So green means nearly or completely achieved, yellow partially, red <coughs> minimally. So for management, a full-time NHI project manager in these 11 districts, you can see four out of 11 so far. Facility improvement team in place doing quite well, but the overall score for quality is very low if you look at the second bar and in fact has deteriorated since last year, which is in this slide, I won't show it. The presence of district clinical specialist teams, where there's supposed to be seven in post, that only two have members in uh, a full complement. I'm almost finished anyway. And for human resources, there is a lot of yellow, some green, no red. That's good. And I'll leave that one. So, finally, what are the key challenges? Well, I think there are challenges in, in partnering with the private sector. 
in improving, improving governance and accountability, and especially in having enough human resources, both in terms of numbers and competences. And I think Louis will talk about the competences. So the NHI could be a mechanism to redistribute healthcare resources. And People's Health Movement strongly supports a people-centered NHI, but we need to overcome some key challenges. We need to know what's going to be the package of services. We don't know yet. This is under wraps. It's being debated. Secondly, <coughs> is there going to be sufficient capacity and accountability to administer this very big pool of funds? Thirdly, regulation of the private sector and, of course, administration of this whole fund. It's not an easy thing to manage a purchase of provider arrangement. We need to, in my view and PHM's view, rapidly increase the ratio of community health workers to households. 1 to 270 is insufficient. And in the National Development Plan, there's a proposal, which we smuggled in, to have many, many more, which could create lots more jobs. And finally, we really need to do much, much better with training. We haven't got enough people. They're not in the right places. They're not properly orientated. And if government doesn't invest enough in creating more posts, training more people in appropriate ways, and finding ways to get our quite large complement of health practitioners out there, I think we're going to have a problem in implementing this. But if we continue in the same way as we are now, I'm afraid only a few people will be able to enjoy private health care, which actually is extremely inefficient. It's very expensive. There's huge over-servicing, and it's increasingly unaffordable. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Um, Louis, if you'd like to... Um, start with your presentation. Okay. Um, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to, to speak about this. Um, I was asked to look at the experience of Red Cross Children's War Memorial Hospital as a possible model for how the NHI could work because it's a public sector hospital that sees both private and public patients um, and trains um, health professionals. And so I'd like to start off by, by looking at that. Um, so can we have an image of the first slide? So this is the uh, slightly unusual view of the children's hospital because it's taken across the Rondebosch Common. <clears throat> the, um, can I move this on? And just to remember, it's a war memorial. The, the hospital was started by public subscription when some returning soldiers from the Second World War decided to establish a war memorial. And they decided they didn't want a statue or uh, something like that. They thought a children's hospital would be more appropriate as a war memorial. The Red Cross Society was not really very instrumental except as the channel of the funds. Um, so people contributed, the Red Cross Society kept the money and the hospital was built and it was opened in 1956. So it's a teaching hospital attached to the University of Cape Town <coughs> and um, also linked to the University of Stellenbosch. And it's a leading center for the training of health professionals, doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, and so on, um, for the country and for the world. Um, so we train undergraduate students and postgraduate pediatricians uh, who are general and, and subspecialists. In other words, people interested in specific organ-related diseases. I was one, I was, I'm a pulmonologist, so I'm interested in um, respiratory disease plus an, a few other things. So does the Red Cross Hospital give us a good model? 
And I think, um, which, which way do you go forward? Yeah, this one. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so the Children's Hospital is um, a center located in the Cape Metro West um, district region of the Cape province. And you can see there where it is on the map. It uh, caters for a population. Well, it, does, it, it, it works at different levels. It works as a regional hospital for that region and caters for a population of about 651,000 children who live in that region. The under five mortality rate in the region is 18. <coughs> Sorry, 16.8, uh, compared to the, the countries now, which has come down to 42, mainly because of the success of the prevention of uh, maternal to child transmission of HIV. But it's also a national hospital because it takes referrals for the sort of higher levels of care from around the country. So in 2012, there were 22,500 admissions to the hospital. Uh, death rate of about 8%, and that's high because of the um, severity of illness. Now, where do the people come from? They come mainly, I'm talking now about the public sector patients, come mainly, and, and they, more than 90%, um, if not more than 95% of the hospital um, admissions. So they come from areas like this, where uh, that, you know, the, the townships around Cape Town, <clears throat> and um, that's the patient care side of it. Uh, teaching hospitals, academic hospitals, have to do four things. They have to provide service, which I've discussed. They have to do research. They have to teach. And they have to do advocacy. Advocacy is a relatively new thing. There's a traditional kind of three stools of service, teaching, and research. So I've discussed service, and I'd like to go into teaching and research which is um, a bugbear of mine. So at UCT, which is what Red Cross Hospital is linked to, um, the relative weighting of teaching and research is heavily skewed towards research. And that's easy to understand. There's huge money in research, you know, and some of it is completely, in my view, irrelevant. It's like comparing one little steroid versus another little steroid for, a blocked, for blocked noses. Nothing to do with what the country needs, but big money. Now, so this balance needs to be restored into something more equitable. I'm not saying research is all irrelevant, but a lot of it is, and it's pointless. Even the relevant research is pointless unless it actually gets to where it makes a difference to people's lives. Now, the teaching side of most universities, this applies around the world, actually, um, is undervalued. And teaching is, um, is kind of, we, 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 we teach the way we were taught. You know, there have been big advances in the way people learn and acquire knowledge and produce knowledge, which is not really um, uh, benefiting health professional education. So recently in The Lancet, there was a big article on training health professionals for the 21st century, which I won't go into now. But you know that the, um, David spoke about re-engineering primary health care. And that is the, the sort of basis of the national health insurance proposal. Robbie spoke about the importance of developing a health system. And that actually what we're doing is working out a way of providing the country with a kind of health system that um, Henry Gluckman visualized in the 1940s. I'll say a little bit more about Henry Gluckman because I think Robbie didn't really give him full justice. Um, but this is the primary health care approach. Maybe you can't see all of it, but the top of the pyramid is the hospitals, like the children's hospital. Then you go down through different levels of the health system. And you have to get into households. You have to get into community. And Gluckman spoke about what he called the modern conception of healthcare. And by that he meant moving out of the hospitals 
and closer to where people live and into households and looking at the causes of disease and ill health and the causes of the causes, getting deeper and deeper. And um, our current crop of health professionals just can't do that. You know, that's not what they're trying to do. They're trying to provide technical medical care to people who are already sick. And so if we get the NHI right, and we also um, extend the thinking that Robert was speaking about to other sectors, then this is possible in this country. Um, so why is it so important to look at the causes of the causes? This is a picture I took recently in Kailicha. This shows some children playing at a standpipe. That is the water supply to 400 people in that area. And as you can see, it's surrounded by filth. Um, this is, this is not 20 minutes from where we're sitting now, is where the conditions under which people are living. Um, so this brings me to the issue of inequality. Now, I'm afraid I'm going to repeat some of the stuff that David has said. This slide I made a few years ago, it comes from the presidency. It shows you, in the blue and green bars, the income of the richest 10 and 20% of South Africans. And if you use a telescope from the back there, you'll see two little brownish dots at the bottom. That's the income of the poorest 10 and 20% of the country. This gap is a time bomb. You know, nothing is going to work unless we close this gap. Nothing. Everything will fall apart. And um, again, uh, this is a recent study by Labrant and others <coughs> that shows you um, if you... If you look at, this shows you the cumulative share of the population from, you know, and the cumulative share of the income. And if we had an a equal country, we'd follow the straight line so that 10% of the people get 10% of the income, 50% get 50%, etc. cetera. Um, but what you can see is the extreme skewing of the income. And it <coughs> compares 1993 with 2008. And it shows you that it, things are getting worse. And why are they getting worse? Because at, you know, inequality is increasing at, amongst all groups of the population. Um, what you can see is that for African people, colored people, Asian people, white people, income inequality is increasing. It's only that little tiny bracket, the richest, the richest of the rich, that are having the, you know, the growth in South Africa. We've seen spectacular growth since 2004. Sorry, since 1994, since the um, democratic election. But it's really gone to the richest 10%. And if you look, you'll see that for all other centiles, the share of the income is actually decreasing. And this is one of the reasons why um, inequality is bad for everyone. Because people get anxious. Inequality is a source of stress, major stress in society. It's stressful to the poor because they're worried about their relative position. But it's also stressful for the rich because they're having to close themselves behind security systems and gates and closed circuit television cameras and barbed wire and stuff. Everyone suffers if there's inequality. P poverty is bad for health. And, but the, the, the gains in health you get from increasing wealth only last up to a certain degree if there's also growing inequality. Um, sure. So, why is inequality, I mean, some of the impacts of inequality, and this comes from the child gauge um, produced by the Children's Institute at UCT, and I see Catherine Walls in the audience, okay. <laughs> who, um, who did a lot of the analysis of the data. And this shows you how inequality impacts on people. You know, if you, um, in the richest 20% of households, no one goes hungry. And as you look down, You'll see that in the poorest, you know, the, the difference between access to water, um, I'm talking now, sorry, about children in the country. Um, inadequate sanitation, overcrowding, being, having inaccessible health facilities because it's too far from home. It's always worse for poor people who already have the biggest burden of disease. And uh, I'll skip some of this. Um, there's inequality, interprovincial inequality, which is shown here. 
David showed this data, which is the impact of various forms of inequality on infant mortality. Access health facilities from the poorest to the richest people. This shows the number of children who live too far from a health facility. And as you get richer, you know, it becomes more accessible. David spoke about the, um, the inequitable system division of health resources between private and public. And here you can see it again. Uh, so I won't go into this in detail, but what I would like to speak about is the fact that we live in an unequal society. And the question we're discussing is whether a decent health system can produce more social solidarity and more equity. Robbie believes it, I believe it. But we have to fix the health system. One of the things we have to fix in the health system is the inequality within it. What this slide shows is the difference in pay, salary scales in the public sector from the top management down to the lowest level of workers. There's 16 scales. And the richest, um, the people at the top, earn 27 times more than the people at the bottom. This is one of the biggest inequalities in the world. And this makes for sickness in the health system. You know, uh, we all know about high levels of absenteeism, about nurses behaving badly towards patients. Why? They are living under tremendous conditions of stress. They themselves are not healthy. This thing has to be fixed as well. And then to go back to Rwanda, and we're looking at Rwanda now because it's recently um, become an example of what happens, can happen with a national health insurance. Rwanda instituted a national health insurance recently. I forget exactly what year they did it in. And they adopted social policies following the genocide that focused on the health system. I'm talking about health policies now, and also focused on reducing inequalities. They haven't got there. In fact, inequalities are still high in Rwanda, but not nearly as high as ours. But um, there are lessons to be learned there. Now, just to remind you of how rich we are and how rich Rwanda is, this shows you uh, uh, GNP per person for South Africa on the left. Next comes Rwanda. Next is the average for the WHO, the World Health Organization's Africa region. And then next is the world. So South Africa, our gross national product is slightly less than the global average. But Rwanda is about a tenth of ours. And if you remember that um, in 2004, the same year that we had our first democratic election, they had a genocide. The country was, sorry, 1994. The country was devastated. Nothing worked. Under five mortality went up to the 270s. 270 children born died before they turned five years old after the genocide. The health system was in tatters. Epidemics were rampant. Yet David showed this and David showed this. But I want to spend a little bit of time on this one because um, this shows you our pro you know, the red arrow here shows you the time of our election and their genocide. And look at what they've achieved. They're much poorer than we are. But this is just stunning. I mean, the, the under five mortality rate has, is now equal to ours in a very short space of time. This is possible. This is possible um, because it's happened. And how did they do it? That's, um, that's where the lessons are. And maybe we can discuss that. Um, so the Rwandan health minister said this. She said, prioritizing equity in the health sector is not only a moral imperative, but uh, also an epidemiologic and an economic one, if we want to grow as a nation. Now, um, to get back to our situation and to the kind of country, the kind of society that we want to build and that we can build, I believe, if we get our health system right. Um, the, um, 
I believe that a, a decent health system can promote social equity. But I would like to, and I'm sure Mark's going to talk about this. Um, the NHI is a bit of a black hole at the moment. None of us know what's going on. The whole idea about um, health systems and health system development is that there should be strong community involvement. There should be transparency in how it's done. It's happening behind closed doors. It's, we, we don't have a clue. Why is the white paper, which has been promised, not emerging? Uh, we, can th we can kind of speculate. You know, this is a danger when things happen behind closed doors, that people start thinking the worst. And the worst, I think, and maybe it's the truth, is that there's a fight going on behind those closed doors between people with vested interests who are benefiting from the current inequitable system and who want to continue benefiting. Um, and, you know, we, we have now, I think Robert made this point very clearly, a historic opportunity to develop a health system in this country that will benefit everyone. This happens about once every generation. My father had it. My father was a doctor, by the way. Um, he was around when Henry Gluckman made his proposal. I don't think he ever even knew about it. You know, and certainly I never discussed it with him. But since that time, and that proposal, interestingly enough, when the British government was looking at the post-war situation in England, and they were thinking about a national health service in England, the health minister, his name is MacDonald, is that right, David? Okay. Um, saw the Gluckman Commission recommendations and said, this report tells us what we must do. And they developed the National Health Service. We threw it out in the rubbish bin, essentially, first with the provinces and then when the apartheid government took over. <clears throat> so what I'm trying to say is that uh, the NHI is uh, something that all of us should be interested in and that all of us should be advocating seriously for a national health service, a single national health service that treats everyone the same. And I think I'll stop there and hand over to Mark. Sorry. Thank you, Louis, um, and for keeping within time. Um, <clears throat> Mark's going to make his presentation. I didn't mention when I was speaking to you that Mark is also on the ministerial task team. Uh, for the NHI, so hopefully he's got some insights and he's going to share some of that with us. Mark? Uh, I just want to start by reading a bit of an email, uh, partly because my battery is running out, but partly because I think we should feel a little bit outraged when we have a discussion like this, rather than just defeated by perpetual inequality. And this is an email from the 25th of June this year from one of the people who work at Section 27 who are doing some research into what's happening in the Eastern Cape with the health, with the collapse of health services. Just interviewed a saintly woman who lost her child and went into Nelson Mandela Academic Hospital to have the fetus removed. They didn't give her any pain medication the child came out feet first. She wandered the halls looking for a nurse to give pain medication whilst the legs of her dead child hung from her. There was no electricity. Nurses were delivering other babies by light of cell phones. Expecting mothers shared beds, no blankets. She had her husband bring her some borrowed from a friend in town. When they finally got in to remove the baby, someone stole the cell phone. Uh, that's, you know, a month and a half ago. And yes, there are extreme stories of indignity from our health system, but they're not rare. And underneath an extreme story like that is a much more common story of daily indignity, daily service failure, daily suffering at the hands of a health system that is meant to heal and to, to repair people. Um, 
And I think that has to be the backdrop to what we can achieve or what, what we can't achieve. Now, I just want to make a couple of preliminary comments. You know, uh, Axel and Fazila said that you know, part of the origins of this discussion comes from thinking about why it's necessary to persuade the middle class in South Africa that NHI is in their, their, their interests, the people who currently know that they're being ripped off but think that at least they're getting reasonable medical care even though they're paying excessively for it. And I think that's an important question. But I think in some ways it's the wrong question with respect. Because I think that the political determinant of whether NHI ever comes into being is persuading poor people that they have a right to health care in this country and that the most efficient way to deliver on that right is through, a, is through a national health system, whatever we call it. Because I would argue, and I'll come to what Louis said just now, that the truth of the matter is that there will be no NHI, there will be no national health system in South Africa if there is not a movement for a national health system. And at the moment, there is not a movement for a national health system. There is not a health movement. There are bits and pieces. There's TAC and the People's Health Movement and bits of the trade unions and so on. But there is not a unified movement for, for justice in, in health. And Robbie, I'm not misrepresenting what you say because it goes to what Louis said, is that the, the issue is, yes, there's a contest of ideas going on. But also, as Louis said, there is a contest of interests, of vested interests going on around national health insurance. And that is the reason for the delay. I mean, I'm an absentee member of the Ministerial Advisory on National Health Insurance because it was just a waste of time for a long time. It's one of those committees that didn't do anything and didn't go anywhere. Uh, pardon that this is being recorded, but to tell you the truth. Um, um, but, you know, but I do know that there has been a, co a contest in government over NHI, in particular between the Treasury and the Ministry of Health about how NHI should be funded and whether there, sh there should be co-payments as a, as, a, as a part of uh, access to healthcare services. And also, there is a contest of vested interests, and I'll say a little bit more about the private healthcare sector in, in, in a minute, because as we've seen already, private healthcare is very good business in this country. And nobody's proposing to do away with the private healthcare sector. And personally, I don't think that it's feasible or that we should, we should even talk about it. Nobody's actually proposing to do away with the medical aid schemes necessarily. But an efficiently, properly instituted system of national health insurance would make those things redundant and would, would give cause for them to wither away. And that is, that is what they understand. So again, you know, I, people leak me lots of documents. <laughs> so I've seen what Netcare is saying, I've seen what MediClinic is saying, all of them are lawyered up. All of them are, they've made their submissions on the green paper, the submissions on the green paper have veiled loyally in between the lines hints of litigation. If uh, the NHI system is not the type of NHI system that they will be satisfied with, and that partially explains <laughs> I believe, the delay that we have between the green paper and the white paper. But one of the things I do want to say in this presentation, though, is that I think it's very important that we give credit to the Ministry of Health for some of the public health sector reforms that are being implemented and for the approach that is being taken to, to national health insurance. And I'll, I'll, I'll so, so, But let me now just get to the, what I wanted to say. Uh, as Fazila said, I, I, my feeling is that the starting point for discussion about NHI and whether it can be achieved is this fact that in South Africa, health is not a commodity. Our supreme law says that everyone has a right of access to healthcare services. 
That says that, that the government has a duty to decommodify health and not allow people who think that health is something that can be made, lots of money made from, to, to determine the framework for health. It's also significant that the Constitution says that no one may be denied emergency medical services. And, and the question of what constitutes emergency medical services is a crucial, unanswered question still in NHI, because nearly 20 years post constitution, there is not a legal definition of what is meant by these three words, emergency medical services. And because there's no legal definition of emergency medical services, nobody can claim that right at the moment. And that would be a critical aspect of NHI. But in the same part of the constitution, section 27, that says this, the actions of the state in trying to put in place a national health system um, are both mandated and justified. Because section 27 says the state must take reasonable legislative and other measures within its available resources to progressively realize the right of access to healthcare services. And put simply, what that means when an NHI idea comes under attack from the private healthcare sector is that the government, when it puts a policy proposal on the table, when it seeks to limit certain powers in order to improve the right of access to healthcare services, is simply doing what the constitution requires of it, which is moving in a direction of delivering quality healthcare for everyone. But 20 years after 1994, as I showed you with that email and as we've seen with the slides, uh, the constitution seems very, very far from the reality. And what we have witnessed is not just the growth of inequality, which has grown significantly, but is actually the deterioration of health outcomes in many respects and the deterioration of certain healthcare services. There is more access to healthcare than there was 20 years ago. But the quality of public health care has degenerated in, in many respects. And I would argue that as we approach NHI, there are two overriding issues now that have to be addressed. The first thing is the quality of public health care services. Uh, as I mentioned, Eastern Cape health system has collapsed. It has literally, Costa will agree, Medicines are not getting to clinics, people are not being paid, uh, machines, equipment are not in the system, there's a bloated bureaucracy and a starved uh, service delivery platform. But I won't go on about the quality of healthcare service, public healthcare service, but that's part one. The second part, which is not unrelated, is the cost and oversupply of, the, of private healthcare uh, in this country. And the two work against each other. It hasn't been mentioned yet today, for example, but you know, bad public health is good private business. <laughs> and there are three major sources of expenditure on health in the country. There's what government spends through tax, there's what the private healthcare sector user spends through medical aid schemes, and then there's what we call out-of-pocket expenditure, which is generally expenditure not by middle class people, but by the poorest of the poor who spend money because the public system can't deliver them their health care. And on an annualized basis, the last figures that I saw said that over 20 billion rand per annum is spent out of pocket on health care. 20 billion rand per annum is spent out of pocket on expensive private health care services. And as we've seen, the other problem with the growth of the private healthcare se sector, the unregulated, uncontrolled growth, is that even those people who think that they are purchasing some sort of security through medical aid schemes discover that they're not. And as I was preparing for this presentation yesterday, I, I discovered something that I'd never heard of before. I'm sure probably many of you have heard about it, but is the, is the, the error of what are called gap plans. Uh, I don't know if people know about gap plans, but gap plan is the insurance that you take out above your medical insurance for costs that you may incur when your medical insurance has run out. Those are called gap plans. And 
in the last five years, there has been a five-fold increase in the number of gap plans that people can buy. And there are today 250,000 different gap plan policies that are in existence to help you top up on your top up. There are also hospital plans, there are also top up plans and, and so on. And as I said, the result of this is a deter it, it, it's caused by a deteriorating public health care system, but it, 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 it feeds inequality and it feeds the private health care system. Some of the strongest opponents of national health, care, health insurance will be hospital groups like Netcare, like Mediclinic and so on. Netcla Netcare's return on capital employed in its hospitals has risen to 25% by 2011 from about 7% 10 years ago. Mediclinic's return on capital employed has risen to 27.3%. And I think you know, one of the things, Fazila mentioned it, that, that we have to get across to middle class people and to people who use the private healthcare sector is that private health is for the most part not world class. You know, you can't equate hospital care, I mean hotel care, <coughs> with health care. The fact that you, you get a nice reception and there's flowers and, and nice bedrooms and so on doesn't mean that the health care is good. In fact, there hasn't been enough research and analysis into the private health care system, but you would find that in many instances the health care is bad. And I can tell you, and I can't name names unfortunately, but two very prominent people who I have know and who have died quite recently, both died as a result of hospital acquired infections in the private healthcare sector, uh, what's called nosocomial in infections. Um, um, and that is a big problem within the private healthcare sector, as is the problem of over-servicing uh, uh, people. We were talking about it last night, you know, you need one blood test, but you get given 25 blood tests and the, the price increases massively, etc. So, so the bottom line is that we need what we would call in, our, in, in the AIDS field combina a combination therapy approach to national health insurance. You need to hit the different points of the problem at the same time. Uh, you need to hit the private sector to the extent that the private sector is unregulated, has uncontrolled spiral in costs, etc. And you need to hit the public health care sector to the extent that the deterioration in the public health care sector, I'm nearly done, it contributes to the, to the growth of inequalities. The vicious circle that, that we have, I describe like this. Deteriorating public health care has led to growing demand for private health care, which is being provided to more and more people at a poorer and poorer quality. That's the strange set of, of, of contradictions that we're dealing with. So, you know, what is the, is, is the way forward? Um, I would argue that, that although not doing it fast enough, uh, the basic approach certainly of the Minister of Health is the correct one at the moment. Um, you know, he is instituting a number of public sector reforms uh, which are very important to lay the foundation for, for, for an NHI system because you can't, you can't have a big bang approach to NHI much as we would like the inequalities to be removed tomorrow. You've actually got to stabilize the system. You've got to improve the platform, the public platform. <coughs> you know, David has mentioned the NHI pilots. You know, people should read the full document that David gave reference to. It's, it's a tragedy that there are these 11 pilot districts. And although the consultants who've written the report have put a gloss on it, the reality is that it's a disaster. What we're seeing is a disaster. But the good thing is that I think, it, for the first time, attention is being paid to the quality of care in the public health care system. People weren't even looking at those, those is, is, issues now. Now the issues of quality are being unearthed. But I would fully agree with my co-panelists that the biggest, one of the biggest problems is that we are not being involved. The big issue that's not being looked at is governance. Why are clinic committees dysfunctional? Why are hospital boards dysfunctional? Well, hospital boards are dysfunctional because that's the place where crooks can get in and control the tenders. 
So, you know, for example, recently, just as an anecdote, and I know I'm out of time, you know, there's no, you can keep going. the district hospital in Ermelo, uh, which is the only hospital in Chet Sabande covering a vast area, and they didn't have any emergency medical service until they built one in Ermelo. But then they built one in Ermelo, but they put it on the second floor, and they put in a lift that's too small to be able to put stretchers inside the lift. <laughs> and that's what happens when you, when, when you have a lack of control and a lack of oversight, particularly from people who are, are users. So, so, so public sector reforms are important. A week ago, Zuma promulgated the Office of Health Standards Compliance. Very important development, an independent institution that is being set up that will prescribe norms and standards for different levels of the healthcare system and which will have an inspectorate that can go in and investigate what is going on and what is the quality of healthcare in, in, in different things. That, that's a revolution if civil society and users of the healthcare system take advantage of it and use it to, to drive demand for health improvement from, from below. But even with these important reforms, one of the problems that we do have as David alluded to, is there are certain things that can't easily be fixed. The human resource crisis, for example. The whole method of calculation. I mean, if you read this NHI pilot thing, one of the things it says is what we found in the pilot districts was that most of the pilot districts had adequate numbers of nurses. But then you read into the about 15 pages later, and it says the reason why there were adequate number of nurses was because the personal system was changed a year ago to wipe out all non-funded posts so that they no longer reflect in, in, in the system. So it's not that there's an adequate number, it's, an, it's that the, the, the norm has become an in, inadequate number. But there isn't a serious plan on the table to resolve the human resource crisis. And without a, hum, a resolution to the human resource crisis, we can't even begin to talk about national health insurance. I mean, David referred to community healthcare workers there's 70,000 community healthcare workers in South Africa, but they are marginalized, underpaid, unsupervised, earning 1,500 rand a month in most, most instances, and subject to corruption. One of the things we discovered in the Eastern Cape is that they're being paid 1,500 rand, but it appears that if you look at the official records of what they're being paid, that they're being paid 4,500 rand. So what's happening to the, to the 3,000 rand? You know, is somebody filching it off in the system? And that wouldn't be surprising in the Eastern Cape, given the levels of corruption. So there's a lot that has to be done in the public sector, and then there has a lot that has to be done in the private sector. And I want to just quickly finish on this. Private sector reforms are very essential to, to, to the national health system. There's an attack going on at the moment on the very notion of prescribed minimum benefits. And prescribed minimum benefits were introduced in 1998 as a way to try to contain costs and to force medical schemes Okay, that's my 20 minutes to, 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 cover, uh, to cover essential conditions. Now prescribed minimum benefits are, are under, uh, under attack. Every attempt to regulate prices by the department has failed, partly because of the, f the, the department's own misguided approach to price control. But the bottom line is that there is no regulation today at all over the costs of specialists, the costs of hospitals, the, Cost and so on and so on. And, th and that is something that is being fiercely resisted, which is why this question of the healthcare inquiry by the Competition Commission becomes so important. Because if the Competition Commission is able to properly investigate what is going on in the private healthcare sector, it can start to find ways to drive down the prices that can alleviate some of the pressure on the public sector because more people can afford to get into the private sector, even if it's just a temporary means. Now, I know that's anathema, na the notion that more people should get onto the private sector may be anathema to some of us because we think there should be no private sector, but it may be a pragmatic way in the short term, if it's affordable and if it's regulated, to take some of the pressure off the public healthcare sector while the public healthcare sector is finished. But the health inquiry, which is meant to start on the 1st of September this year, is already under attack. There are some people who some institutions that don't even want the health care inquiry to get beyond its terms of reference. So again, it's something that people who are, have an, an interest in health and justice must pay attention to. So I think I want to conclude by saying, that answering the question we were asked to ask, can NHI be achieved? Uh, it, it can be achieved, but it can't be achieved unless there's a movement for the right to health, unless 
People like us insist that Motswiladi and company take seriously our rights to participate in decision making in relation to health and in the governance of, 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 the, of, of the health system. And you know, coming back finally to, to the question of the, of, of the middle classes, I think they are an important people to bring, sector to bring into the equation of justice because middle class people are being ripped off for poor quality health care. But middle class people will only be woken up when poor people start making the suffering that they experience in the public health system visible. And when poor people start saying, well, you know, a few weeks ago everybody jumped up and down about Nelson Mandela and what Nelson Mandela and the 67 minutes, but Nelson Mandela stood for something and he stood for dignity and he stood for solidarity and social solidarity and cross-class and cross-race solidarity. And so there has to, I think, be some sort of bridgehead into getting that class of people to understand why health is important and why getting a decent and fair healthcare system in South Africa is, is possible. Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you.